All righty, we are at the hour. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, just quick housekeeping. If y'all have questions during the discussion, please do drop them in the questions panel. And we'll be happy to handle those at the end during the Q&A. So we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. I'm excited about our discussion today. Got a couple of great folks here from the industry. Um, I want to apologize to everyone. Uh, Eric Thomas was supposed to be your host today and he is a fantastic moderator. He's feeling a little under the weather, so I'm filling in for him and I'm not nearly as good, so give me a little grace. Um, but I, I think that these folks are strong enough to stand that they don't need too much help from me to move things forward. So we're gonna get started with the ben benefits of adopting a construction platform. Um, I would love to hear from the two of you on some intros. Do you think you could kind of just fill me in on your role at your company, and especially as it relates to technology adoption and implementation? And maybe we'll do ladies first. Heather, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Gosh, there's like 200 people on this call. I was expecting like 10. So this is really exciting to have this much interest. Uh, my name is Heather Sutherquist. I'm with uh, Jacobson Construction. I am the Director of Operations Training and Development. Um, this role, Operations Training Development, it's a, it covers a broad range of, of scopes of work. Uh, in addition to training, uh, I manage all of the software related to operations, uh, along with all of the processes and procedures. In addition, I um, supervise our VDC department. Um, this position was created about three years ago for me, and it was really intended to start bridging the gaps um, and the struggles that we were having with getting technology really implemented within our company. So I like to think of myself as I'm that bridge that, that fills that gap between operations, our field people, um, and IT, as well as just operations and accounting and everything main office, just kind of, I am that kind of the translator uh, among those groups. And uh, with my background in project management and my passion for technology, it really has become that bridge, that ability to bring um, different groups together and utilize technology in a way that we have just really struggled in the past. So that's a little so bit about me. Say you're not busy at all because you're only wearing about, I, I think I heard four or five hats there. Just a couple, yep, just a couple. Nice, thank you very much. And Brian, why don't you talk a little bit about your role, please? So the title, Director of Construction Innovation, um, much like Heather's role, um, I head up a, a VDC group of, of 10 today, hopefully 15 tomorrow. Um, but I also um, am in, in charge of uh, technologies for the field. So project managers, superintendents, foremen, um, and how that technology gets from the office to the field. Um, so that's, that's kind of my focus. Um, and then in the office, um, how that technology in the field connects to everything else. So um, much like Heather, my, my role turned into a lot of training and implementation um, that maybe I didn't expect at first, um, but uh, I, I love technology. I love uh, better processes, uh, finding efficiencies, um, and, and I really get a lot of joy out of watching the light bulb go off when you've really helped somebody and, and you see them get excited when, when they realize the benefit um, of some of technology to them. Uh, so that's what I do over here at Myron. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and then I'm Sarah Lee. I also am in charge of implementation process and process improvement, but I do it on the marketing side. Um, I have a multifamily development and management background before joining a little construction startup called Pipe. Um, and then we joined Autodesk uh, in 2020. So I've been a happy member of the Autodesk family for a bit. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, move through some of these questions here today. So. Let's dig right into it. Um, I'm just gonna throw up this agenda here. Um, this is what we're working on today. And I'm gonna start off with um, a great question. I like this question on the list. Is that what was the biggest drivers that made your organi organization start down the path of digitization? 
and resulted in a wider adoption of construction technology. And we can argue about who goes first, or we can keep the same order. What do y'all want to do? You want to take the? You want me to take this one, Heather? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so first, I would say it never feels like it's fast enough, right? Um, trying to keep up with technology um, is is there's definitely a different pace with technology and improvement than the implementation of it, and and so I'll come back to that. But um, I, drivers today, um, I would say number one would probably be keeping up with competition, um, going after projects, um, marketing, trying basically keeping up with the Jones. I mean that that is a piece of it. Um, I think the, the second driver that I think about is um, the rollover of a workforce. Um, so we've had a lot of superintendents and foremen um, retire and, and the next generation coming in has gotten a taste of uh, mobile devices, has, has gotten a taste of the cloud, which kind of leads me to the third and I, and I would say the cloud has really driven um, technology specifically in the field. Um, you combine the use of mobile devices with the generation that grew up with the phone, the mobile device, and the internet and the cloud. And I think that's what I think underlying is, is driving um, that change in construction. Yeah, I think cloud is, is so huge, that interconnectivity and that ability to kind of keep data um, safe and accessible in real time is really important. Heather, was there anything that you wanted to add in there that you guys had some specific experiences with digitization and adoption? Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, if I if I take you back um, around uh, 2018, 2019, that's when we as an organization really started to see more and more people interested and in asking for technology. Um, you know, owners, our project teams, there was just this, this sense of um, wanting it. They didn't know what they wanted or how they wanted it, but they were starting to get the sense of, hey, there's this technology out there. How, how do we get some of that? And uh, you know, in the last few years, what we've really seen is um, technology companies, vendors, now understanding how to facilitate construction. I think they really, we've been a little bit behind or the vendors on construction have been a little bit behind on really understanding the construction industry and how to accommodate our needs. And I think now those are coming closer and closer together, um, which is making it just that much more possible and the and, and the reason to just really jump in um, and make technology part of our everyday process. Um, and now today, uh, our focus in our organization is to leverage technology to get those field guys back to the field, you know, get them spending less time processing and doing all of the admin work and really where they should be, which is focused on the problems and building quality buildings. And so that's kind of where our driver has now been is how do we do that? Get our people back to the field, building great buildings and spending less time in the processes, you know, the paperwork, the admin stuff. Yeah, a little less tedium, a little bit more talent, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think those, I think they resonate a lot, no matter, you know, where you live, if you're on the marketing side or um, obviously like actually in building something, um, it's, it's so important to understand what people are asking for, um, answer that ask, but make sure you're evaluating it. So I, I was excited to hear that people were um, featured in both of y'all's responses. So um, we have another great question for you, which is um, coming into, like, let's narrow the focus a little bit out of digitization, coming into specific software. What are some of your top criteria as you are evaluating different systems to implement at your company. I'll, ahead, I'll take that. Do you want me to go first? And we'll just bounce right back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so um, maybe a little different spin than maybe a lot of people, but one of the things that I look at is um, I, I try to step back from looking at a software about what it can do today 
Now, certainly that's important. You know, you need a software that's going to do all of the things that you need it to do. But I like to look at it and say, okay, where is this company going to be in two years? You know, usually when we we buy or invest in software, it's usually a three to five year kind of commitment or in the back of our mind where, you know, there's so much effort that goes into this stuff. You know, you're not just most likely going to use it and move on. You're really going to invest in it. But so I like to just um, suggest that, you know, look at it from a perspective of where is this company going to be in two years? Are they agile? You know, things change so quickly in technology. We've seen it so much, um, but also our needs and our wants change. And so is this company able to basically turn on a dime and go the direction that people are asking for? Um, is their overall big vision or their two to three year plan, does it align with what you think you're gonna wanna be doing? Um, and not just today. We get really hung up on today and I would just recommend that you really look at what is that gonna look like in a couple of years from now and what do I wanna do beyond today? Um, the other big thing for me is partnership with that vendor. Uh, is that vendor open to a relationship, meaning not just a transactional, but do they want to listen to um, where we think it should go, how it's working or not working for us? Do they um, are they defensive or are they just open to listening to what we're finding is wrong or we would like differently? And then uh, you'll hear a little bit more later about this, but really just um, are they where are they with? Um, a vision of um, APIs and moving data from not just their platform within their platform, but from other platforms in in and out. And I think that's a big one because I really think that's where we're going in the future. Um, so that's what just one thing I uh, would be looking for when when we're vetting software. So ready to go, looking for a partner. Um, and then the importance of owning, like kind of managing your own data or, or being able to move your data so that you can remain agile and, and partner with new technology as it comes out. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. And Brian, do you have anything you want to add in there? Well, yeah, a lot of the same things. Um, you know, number one is relationships. And I know Heather touched on that in a lot of different ways. But I'm looking for a company that I can go have a drink with. I'm looking for a company that I can uh, call. Um, and, and get to know them um, and understand what drives them. I'm looking for some relationships uh, that matter when I when I need support and training because that that is that is a big deal. Um, and then, like Heather said, uh, connectivity with data is really important. Um, you know, we also look. You know, another thing to remember too is I feel like we've there's always going to be something new that's coming, but but the new things have slowed down. You know, now it's a matter of, I think you're finding technologies that replace your current tech stack. And so you really are looking at, at your, at your, at a new technology and you're, you're analyzing the, the simple things of ease of use. Um, where does it overlap your current tech stack? What, what functionality does it overlap and is it better? Um, can, if I implement this one piece of software, can I get rid of two? And the reason I say that is um, there's a sense of software fatigue um, in the field. Um, and then I kind of mentioned it before, technology is moving so fast and you can only implement and train that at, at, at a certain speed <laughs> with, with the resources that we have. And, and so what, what I fear is that gap, that gap between where technology is and where your field is and, and it's always a constant battle of making sure that you don't let that gap get too large yet you don't push your field to the point of turning them off um and, and you, you gotta there, there's a fine balance there so you need to be very cautious um i think the days of ch chasing the next shiny object are, are definitely over so software companies they really need to um, prove their values in a lot of different ways. It's uh -huh. not about one thing you can do anymore. It's about uh, the whole package. Yeah, I'm hearing like, I feel like there's an area of overlap between Heather, what you said about um, kind of that agile, almost future proofing, like are they gonna be able to grow? And what you're saying with your, your folks in the field is that there's that inertia, right? Like this is what I know, this is what I've used. And so when that, that what you know and, and use gets to grow with you and fit the new needs and demands of the business versus having to find some all new thing to, 
to meet the business needs. I think that's so important. Um, and I love that uh, you talked about relationships about somebody you can get a drink with, because to me, that speaks of like a level of trust, right? So you're, you're building a level of trust with, you know, people, but also a company so that you, you can feel safe that you're going to get that information that you need to build that partnership, to have that, you know, agility and, and, um, and get what you need for your teams. And I like that, that, that thought of keeping teams first, keeping teams first. We always um, estimate, underestimate the effort of change. Mm-hmm. And you're just to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, yes, we have to change. If we're not changing, um, we're dead in the water. Um, we have to always change and grow. Um, but we have to be careful we don't underestimate the effort um, that it takes to, to, to make change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and I would just also just add into that, you know, probably the people on this call are interested or probably in some kind of position that Brian and I are at where they're the ones trying to implement or add this software or introduce it. And and I would just say also you have to really take on those end users that, you know, you you look at construction and building, they're changing all the time. They're dealing with a, pro, a new problem every single day and they're so agile at it. But then somehow when you introduce technology, it's like the wheels fall off. And I think for those uh, who are having to try to implement and and um, um, basically sell this, uh, just don't take that for granted. Like just because these people are very agile and they they deal with change in the field, doesn't mean that they're going to be that. It's going to be that way when you do technology. It's a it's it's almost apples and oranges, and really just really being prepared for that and slowing that process down. And we're, we're, we'll talk about that in training, but as Brian kind of alluded, you know, you got to slow it down. We, we think, oh, it's great. We got to hurry and get it done and then check the box, but really slowing it down and not having this expectation that, oh, they're already good at change. Um, mm -hmm. Cause that usually doesn't end up well for us in our experience as the implementer is just left like, ah, that was a bad experience. Yeah, I think my experience have been like in development that the folks that that work in the field, they're creative thinkers and they're intuitive problem solvers. And so that's what they do all day, every day is, you know, fix, you know, put out fires, fix stuff, get it done. And so technology can can build a ton of efficiency for them, but it also provides kind of some structure to the way that they problem solve sometimes. And that can be that kind of like, oh, well, this is a little weird and I got to get used to it. Um, but I think that being cognizant of that is really important and finding those folks that are excited about it um, and can really bring it um, in a meaningful way to the rest of the team is so important. So I'm glad you touched on that. Um, I wanna dig in a little bit more into something, Heather, you kind of uh, touched on in your earlier response about data. And so I wanna talk about how data fits into y'all's process and what guidance you can share to kind of help um, other project teams make sure they're capturing the right information. Great. Rain, do you want to take this? Do you want to lead us out on this one? Or? I can. All right. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, so here's where I, here's where I let the curtain down and, and I admit, you know, this is where I, I've probably um, um, dropped the ball a little bit. You know, data, unfortunately, tends to be an af afterthought. Um, and it's one of those things that you have to have early on. Um, you know, when we're implementing new technology, it's about the training and uh, getting acceptance. And so you spend so much energy um, making sure that you have teams trained and you have them up to speed and you're supporting them and you're trying to get that acceptance that you kind of forget about the back end, the data. And, and once they get that acceptance, here's the warning that I will give. And that is once they, the light bulb, I talk about the light bulb, once the light bulb goes off and they realize what they can get back now, um, you're going to be doing a lot of reporting, a lot of dashboards, a lot of, oh, can I get this? Can I get that? Because they realize that, oh, I put all this data in and now there's tools to get it out. So my advice, um, just lessons learned, um, templates, templates, templates. Um, don't try to, when you're creating your templates, um, align your 
properties or your attributes or your you know your data um, align the naming um, try to align with what's happening already in your company don't go off and, and create a silo of your own I want to collect this data that nobody else is collecting um, because at the end of the day you're gonna to have to align those things um, we use a lot of Power BI and, and that's kind of you know we use Power BI as the glue at times between our different enterprise solutions um, and, and the more you can align the data you're collecting with the data that other teams are collecting, I think the easier that gets. So, um, templates. Go ahead, Heather. Yeah, good. Well, you know, I can kind of um, ride your coattails because when, when it comes to how do we use data to fit into this process, um, I am certainly not an expert. Um, and I would say that trying to figure out what the right data is. Um, up front is is very difficult. You know, you don't, especially when you're not used a, um, you know, a platform of any sort, like a collaboration platform, it's really, a, it's very difficult to know what data is going to be useful and what data is just going to be overwhelming and just a bunch of noise. Um, so what I would say is if you're starting out and you're trying to figure out where to start, um, I'd say look at the big picture, come create a big um, picture vision and start looking at the different groups, like um, the your project managers versus your superintendents, um, your operations, like executives versus um, the individual projects, and start looking for gaps or, and ask yourself, like, if I had this data, how could I bring these two groups or departments together with this data, with knowledge? Um, and if this was if this data was here, how would that make a difference? And um, and you'll probably find that in some cases you're well, maybe it doesn't make a difference. And then others would be like, wow, that would really make a difference if both groups had this information at the same time. As least a starting point, and that's what I'm doing. And then from there, then as you start putting data and you start collecting data, then you can start reevaluating. Okay was was our assumptions about this data correct? Is the reporting, you know, using dashboards, um, other kind of reportings, as Brian alluded to, there'll, there'll be lots of requests and you'll start you doing a lot of reporting, but then as you, you'll start getting that data and being able to say, yes, this is very helpful, or this is just noise, or it's just this one-off you know, request. Um, but then you can start actually using it um, where we are not at yet, that I think is going to be really interesting, is does this collection of data start changing the decisions that we make? You know, will we start making decisions based on this data that we're collecting, based on these dashboards? And uh, you know, I, I don't know that yet. We're so very curious to see how how we're going to, or maybe not going to. Um, but I think that starting out with kind of just identifying what is it that you are hoping the data is going to do and what data do you need to have in order to, you know, actually use it as it may be a good start. Yeah, I like that idea, too, of not kind of turning on the full fire hose, like kind of letting letting it trickle and understand what you actually need and whether or not it's relevant, because um, that can totally be overwhelming. So one thing that I guess I want to dive a little deeper in the template thing. One yeah. thing that I did that I found a lot of success in was I met with individual teams. Um, for example, I, I met with safety and risk and, and uh, I, I'm trying to be software agnostic, but if, if anybody knows ACC or BIM 360, they know what an issue type is, right? So going through the issue types, uh, what matters? Going through the root causes, what matters? Um, in aligning that with their current process. Um, the assets, working with our commissioning teams to set up a tree that makes sense for every project. You know, that was something we templatized. And then also we've added issue types to go along with that. And then aligning daily logs in, in how the superintendent would collect in the field and how could we do that across all projects so that we could report on it at the end of the day. So I guess the point being is it, it was worth going to each individual team, um, not only to get feedback, but you also get a little bit of buy-in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Being heard. So um, I think that was really important, templates and, and how you get to them. Yeah. 
we call those road shows when we go and talk to everyone kind of in small groups and kind of really get that like candid feedback. It's been so helpful. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. We've touched on a lot of um, ways that you guys have uh, driven the team forward and kind of implemented change, but I want to um, kind of do some problem solving. I'd love if you guys could share just a couple of common challenges you've experienced um, with adopting new tools or technology and maybe where you found success in managing those challenges specifically. Brian, okay. do you want to start this time? Or wait, I think it's Heather's turn, my bad. <clears throat> yeah, okay, I'll start. Um, so I would say one of our common challenges is, um, and again, coming from the side of, hey, I've got this you know, new shiny object, this new technology, I want you guys to start using it, is um, that we have to remember that, you know, if we're in the business, we're probably successful companies, we're not broken, the company's not broken, the process isn't broken. And trying to remember um, that you're not there to um, fix or change something that's broken, but more enhance. Um, and why do I say that's a challenge? Because if it's not, it kind of goes into my second challenge, which is if you don't have the right person to um, introduce technology and to bring it out in a way that people are going to um, adopt it and embrace it, um, that's where it kind of falls apart, is meaning if it's coming across as you're trying to fix or change something that's broken, you're gonna get a lot of resistance. Um, even if it's like the greatest thing ever, and you're like, how could you not love this? This is so, but if it's coming across as it that it you're trying to, that something's broken, it, it, it really just shuts the process down almost before you start. And again, um, I have just seen so much, and it's not because of me personally, but more because of my position where I am able to focus on um, technology and what that means to our field and picking the right source and then training it. Uh, we have done more in the last three years than we had done over, I don't know, a lot of years because we always were trying to take a project manager or take somebody um, and and let technology be their part-time job um, or have VDC um, go test out project management software and then try to sell it to operations, which that doesn't work. You know, you really need someone who has been in the trenches, who can talk the language of operations, who understands their day-to-day, -day, but also gets technology, also has a passion for it. Um, and those are those are real challenges that that we've really struggled with over the years. Yeah, if you've ever had a design team tell you how you should do model coordination you would understand how a project manager must feel when you tell them how they should do their project management <laughs> and, and and it's really you really do have to in our position you really do have to step back and really put all agendas aside um, there cannot be an agenda um, if you have an agenda you're you're almost you're almost doomed to fail you have to sell the tools to the end user they have to be the ones that champion it. And so, you know, some lessons learned when it comes to implementation and training and that is picking the right team. Um, and Heather said that you you have to pick a team that's willing, that's uh, engaged, um, that is bright and willing to uh, try out new things and that you know, certain people are excited for that. Timing is huge. Um, don't set yourself up to fail by jumping in on a project just because you got an opportunity, but the project's already kicked off and the team's already going down a different path. Um, so be smart about timing. Uh, wait for your next opportunity. I would say a few projects is okay. Um, it's not about quantity. Um, believe me, it's about having a successful one or two or three teams that talk about it um, because things spread like wildfire. Um, if, if something works, everybody knows about it in a week. Um, and I've learned that. And, but if it doesn't work, you're, you're kind of doomed. You, you only get one shot at it. So it's really important to be smart about the project, the team, the timing. Um, yeah. I'm hearing so many parallels between how you uh, assess software partners and how you choose your implementation teams. 
folks that you know, can build a good relationship with that are willing to like build that relationship back with you that are bright that are forward looking um that's i don't know that was kind of fun to see um we have had a really robust conversation and we we ate up a lot of time and i'm hoping that you guys can stay on just like five minutes longer so we can hit up some of these q a questions um while we're kind of uh sorting through some of these questions that have come in and there's been a ton and just fair warning to our audience we're not going to get to all of these but we can absolutely reach out to you after the fact and answer some of these because they're great questions i'm going to go ahead and launch um, a quick poll so that y'all can answer this either on your way out or as we talk about some of these questions um, you'll get a break from our smiling faces and so for this first question um and heather and, and brian just feel free to kind of jump in with uh whoever wants to answer um this first one is about um silos so it says how do you avoid department silos and encourage knowledge sharing between people and departments in your company so i, I guess i'd like to take this one because it's fresh in my mind um we're really trying hard to break down silos today with something as simple as our project folder structure now you would think that that was something really simple I will tell you 15 months later and meeting with multiple, multiple groups that it's not simple and it's directly related to process and how teams communicate between them. But I would say that it was probably the most beneficial thing that we've done in the last five, 10 years was breaking down those silos and talking to all those teams. And it all started with just taking another look at our project folder structure, which had been 20 years old and did not align with our cloud and our other workflows today. Do you want me to give an answer or do you want to go to the other questions? Um, I think that's a great answer unless you have something you want to nope. add on. We have we have more that we can grab. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, the next question we have, um, is from eric and he is looking to hear about any specific technologies you're willing to share that you've pushed to the field um and what their feedback has been to embracing it just some examples of that experience you take that other yeah sure oh man uh where to start well you know i um we partnered with um autodesk build in um december of 2021 so it's almost been a year so or less than a year and um we've you know we we've done really well i would say that our one of the most shocking things for for us has been are those real field guys the superintendents general foremans subcontractors have embraced that so easily and so quickly um, that it's been more on the the pmpe side that's been a little bit less um, adoptive so it's that part was really an interesting thing but not not like extremely uh but it's just been uh very very um exciting to see because you know we talked about it before this whole phone ipad thing uh they get that they they know it um mm -hmm. software started addressing the fat fingers you heard well i have fat thumbs if you if you've been talking to your builders you hear that a lot and it, that doesn't really exist anymore so um we we've done we did that that's just one that's our biggest um uh, overhaul we've done in the last year um and it's been going it's been going very well um not perfect but very well and really excited about what we're able to to provide to the fields. Awesome. And I think this is a closely related question um, that maybe has a very different answer though, which is what's the process been for executive level buy-in? Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, go yeah. ahead, Brian. You answer it. Well, I I, I have a short answer. Um, we too have have been um, on the journey of ACC build for for about 15 months now. Um, executive buy-in would be coming from a couple different levels. I would say they hear things from design side, the design partners, 
and executives hear things from owners. And there's a buzz today about those tools. And so unfortunately, it's not really hands-on in my opinion, in my experience that they're getting their opinions from, it's from outside sources. The only piece that I see the buy-in coming in would be feedback they hear from their teams or they, the Power BI dashboards, the, the dashboards that they can get um, executive-wise. Heather, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, um, I would say the same thing. I, you know, when we were first, you know, getting the buy-in, if you mean getting the buy-in to actually invest or partner with somebody, um, you know, that's maybe a different answer than uh, when you have it um, going. But I would say once you have it going, I, I would align uh, with Brian. A lot of executives are going to be listening to those outside, whether it's their teams, their team members, or owners. Um, to get buy-in from executive level, um, you know, in our group, it was still, it was pretty hands-off. Um, I did really all of the work to kind of um, set it up as far as pros and cons. And really, executive levels, they need vision. They need to know big picture. Um, if you're not able to um, address the why and what the value is, you know, and what what is it going to be like in five years, um, you're going to really struggle with executives because that's where they live and breathe. So I would just say if, if you're trying to sell a software, um, go big picture and find find the why. What What is the value? Awesome. And again, still paralleling that those the, the conversations with people internally are, are paralleling some of the things that you guys highlighted at the beginning in terms of how you evaluate technology in terms of forward looking building relationships. And so it's really nice to see those themes come out in your responses. And um, hopefully this was very helpful for the folks that attended. We had a, um, great participation from the audience in terms of the poll. Um, it, we have a ton of other questions that we just don't have time for today. Um, we, we will make sure to have someone reach out with um, the answers to these questions. We're also gonna make a recording of this presentation available to everybody that registered. That'll come out via email. Um, and I wanna just, personally thank both Brian and Heather. We had not met before this morning and this was a fantastic conversation. I'm really excited that you were able to join us. Um, and thanks for, you know, just rolling with the punches and 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 being flexible um, and letting me join you for the convo today. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. I could keep yeah. doing this all day long. This is fun. I love it. All right, well, thank you again. Um, we're gonna close this out now. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thanks great. all and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.